Bonnie Lim from Go 90 FM. This is Hamish Brown. And we want to say welcome to the future. These are all our future chefs. How about a big round of applause for uh, yourself? Yeah, I'm looking at the future right here. We're very happy by what we see. That's right. I can't wait to nice. have my meals prepared by you. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, today, of course, the Meat and Livestock uh, of Australia Youth Chefs Day, and as you can see today, on this stage is going to be a fabulous afternoon uh, of getting very close to your craft. I think that's a nice way of putting it. That is indeed. So this is the opportunity actually for all of you to ask all the questions that you want to ask. I know that sometimes as students, you get a little bit worried, is that the right question to ask? There's no such thing as a right or wrong question. There is only a question. Okay, so today feel free to shoot questions because uh, it's a very, very rare occasion that you get up and close with all the professionals of your trade mm -hmm. to find out the inner workings of the craft that you have chosen for yourself, okay? We would also like to take a few moments to thank uh, all the very important people uh, whose support, without which this couldn't have happened, our presenting partner, primary partners, partners, and gourmet partners. All of them, big thank you to you. And of course you, because today, this whole show is going to be for you. Okay, so before we start anything, uh, a very important and special person, a, a very good friend of Hamish and mine as well, the man who made today possible, this is the very, very first time that it's happening. So ladies and gentlemen, can we please have a big round of applause for the head honcho himself, Mr. Peter Kinnear. Maggie, I take offense. Why? She says big. <laughs> it's only the uniform that makes me big. Thirty first of July nineteen ninety six I took off this uniform to start a different life. I worked twenty five years as a chef. I started at a young ripe age of sixteen. Where I came from, Berlin, Germany, at that time, we are not allowed to go army. Maybe you can talk to your VIP a little bit here, you know, whether you can skip these two years. But I can't say too much, because now my son is in NS, and he's about to come out in September, October. The Swiss do have to go to the army, whether they like it or not. I became a chef for all the wrong reasons. At that time, my hometown was surrounded by a wall. You know, in the old communist era. And as a young boy, 14 years old, I had a couple of dreams. One was to come to Asia. I grew. And I said, okay, what is the fastest to get out of a very beautiful home country, but I wanted to see the world? And spoke to a lot of people. My father was in a very different line of business. And I realized that as a chef, I could actually travel. At that time, 16 years of age, if you went into a hotel, they kind of blackmailed you and said, okay, you want to be a chef? You have to serve one year in the front office. You know, these kids that line up that carry the luggage. One way of getting cheap labor. So you don't say about Asia, cheap labor, this and that. Trust me, my own home kampong, they had the same thing too. So I served one year grumbling in the front of the house. It was only many, many years later. I understood how important that time was for me. Today, in our new society, we call it cross-training. Encourage people to go and work in other department to see what's going on. But at that time, of course, when you're young, you don't understand these things. You're always smarter than the older ones, naturally. I keep telling my sons. It makes no difference, because I was also smarter at that time. Then I started my apprenticeship program for three years in Berlin in a very, very famous hotel. And I realized the moment that I put down my apprenticeship and I got my certificate, it's going off to see the world. It was stuck in there. Remember, I was transferred not too far at that time, it was to West Germany, another hotel, was in the same group. Mom put me on the train. Kiss, 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 goodbye. I was 20 years of age. Dad put me on the train too and made sure, check your bag, put a bottle of whiskey inside for the potential late nights. He didn't know the damage he did. 
I went into a city called Düsseldorf. And Düsseldorf in the 70s was very famous for the longest bar in the world. Four stories high, building after building. So the first three months that I worked in that hotel, we worked and we played hard. Then I was transferred to Switzerland. Another thing that I only appreciated years later, because a German, young, going to Switzerland was a little bit like cannon fodder. We were made to work from morning to night. Best training I ever had. Because one thing you can trust the Swiss, it comes to precisions. After the Germans, only the Swiss are better. Ah, there's more to come, trust me. <laughs> At this moment, I'm being very nice to him. And so I did Switzerland, finished the season, came back, and went off to Canada. i never forget 1975, 22nd December, I landed in Canada, minus 22 degrees. I stayed 13 months, I did two winters, and I said, okay, I started an early bucket list. One item was never ever in a country where there is even a hint of a snowflake. Not me. I'm not an Eskimo. So Asia it was, the tropics it was. Did that for a year, went back to Berlin and I was job hunting. 22 years old. Application to Tokyo, reject, too young. Manila, reject, too young. And then it just went all the way through until finally I ended up in Sydney and I went to Sydney, was supposed to go to Sydney, they gave me a job. But somewhere in between, I was always into competitions, because as a young chef, competition is important for creativity's sake. It's an outlet where you can play, play. And if you screw up, nobody is going to come to you and give you a bad mark, because not winning a medal, it's the only mark you're going to remember. So major learning experience. And I went to Switzerland, they had this international culinary exhibition, met a head, Honcho from Hilton International at that time, and he said, oh, we may have a job for you. Where? Kuala Lumpur. Where is that? Okay. Go quickly. No internet at that time, eh? The old-fashioned atlas, eh? Look, look, eh? Today you just Google. <laughs> you know exactly everything. So I accepted. Arrived in February 78 in Asia was in Singapore, Paya Leba Airport. A little bit different to Changi Airport. You open the door and you got hit. 33 degrees. I regretted what I said two years earlier about Canada. <laughs> now you just imagine that 50 degrees different from 22 minus into 33 plus, eh? that 55 degrees. Eh? You do that in cooking, you're in major trouble. Got my visa. I had two suitcases with me, full with chef's knives. We had to have our own knives, our own uniforms and everything. People weren't as generous at that time. And trust me, the salaries were not exactly fantastic either, especially when Swiss won the show. <laughs> you think you got a problem with salaries? I had to learn fast because there was no mom, there was no dad, there was no relative, nothing. Then they got me the visa to go to KL, I went to KL. And I met the man that actually hired me the first time. Swiss guy, of course. He <laughs> said to me, oh my God, you know, the Swiss, it doesn't matter where I go, they're always on my neck. <laughs> True to speak, during that time, the only three chefs you would find regularly in hotels were German, were Swiss, and then occasionally a French, maybe. The man that hired me to come to Asia is standing behind me. He is responsible. So if you have something good to say, say it to me. If you have something else to say, you can talk to him. <laughs> and we both had very unique careers. And that's why I asked Mr. Huber to be here today. Because by training, he's a butcher. Then he became an executive chef. Then he became director of F&B. You all know Dynasty Hotel. He rose through the rank. Then he opened his first independent butchery. So you see life is going full, full cycle. And today, Hubert's Butchery has won a number of awards. 
And Mr. Huber also received the Lifetime Achievement Award for his accomplishments. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Huber. When you're young, you go through the learning process, you're allowed to make mistakes. Just make sure you don't do the same freaking mistake two or three times. I remember one young kid came to me once and said, Chef, I didn't win a gold medal. Okay, what did you do? Oh, I followed last year, this was so beautiful that I copied. Okay, what did he win last year? Nothing. Ah, so you copied nothing to make nothing again. Very well done. It happens. Today, you're very fortunate. We have five culinary institutions in Singapore of repute, or six, I believe. In 1982, the first one, I believe it's called Chartik, was just formed. At the time that we grew up, the television program, if there was a cooking show at all, it was usually an elder gentleman or an elder lady that did some home cooking. Today, you have four cable channels to choose from, and the proliferation of the chef's profession has taken an amazing turn to the positive. And of course, Singapore is a place, now that foreign talent is, uh, is under scrutiny, right? Government said, okay, chop, chop. More locals have to get into the profession. But there is a thing, if all of them become chefs, Who's going to do the service? As a young chef, you always made fun of the service. It took me a little while to figure out that actually the service stuff, the waiter, the sommelier, the maitre d', they were, they were my sales managers. So during my time in the Ruffles, we actually did an exchange program. We put a cook into the front and we put the front in the kitchen. It was an amazing learning experience for both. And I recommend that any of you with ambitions to either work in a hotel, a restaurant, or even open your own. I mean, after all, most of you are Singaporean or you're Asian, and there's not a single Asian I don't know that says that they don't want to open their own place. Everybody in this room has a dream of opening their own place. We don't have enough restaurants in Singapore. We only have about 7,000 or 8,000 and we only suffer the biggest stuff shortage in the world, but that's okay. So I wish you all well. End of the day, it's not just about the food, it's not just about the cooking. Most importantly, it's about the passion. It's about what you have here. I used to tell my young chefs when I hired them, you want 925? Please. Immigration office, 925. Government, 9 to 5, but even that has changed. I understand there was a friend of my son's, he said, you know, your, your buddy is working where? Oh, he's working in the ministry of something, something, and it's about work-life balance. I say, fantastic, have they figured it out? Yeah, kind of. He starts at 8 and he goes home at 11 o'clock. <laughs> so they're working very hard to try and figure out work-life balance. So you can see, even on upper circles, they're still looking for answers. The reality is, when you're a chef, and no difference for a baker, the bakers are even worse off because they start four o'clock in the morning if they really want to do the hands-on. Chefs, you have breakfast, lunch and dinner, in restaurants you have lunch, dinner, or only dinner. Whatever the case is, 12 o'clock, the show starts, you're on stage. 2.33 o'clock, guests leave, you're off stage, you do mise en place for the night. So any of this eight hour days or nine hour days, you can kiss this pretty much goodbye, it doesn't exist. And then restaurants have to operate six days a week at least in order to make it happen. So, our goal, you've got to be able to stand the heat. You've got to be able to take the stress. It's the most beautiful profession in the world. Even so, some agencies don't call it a profession. They say professionals are doctors, lawyers, and so on. We call it the most beautiful profession in the world. Because nowhere do you have the ability to create, to influence. No day is the same, even so it looks the same. Every dish you go out is its own unique experience. You'll be judged not on one time, but on your consistency, on what you're producing. 
and that is really important. We have a number of speakers with us today, each one from a different field. Each one has something to share. You have Mr. Huber starting off, the master butcher, master hotelier. It's an incredible achievement what he has gone through his life and we're very blessed to have him. He also told me that last week he was at Chartec and he found a few people that were nubbing off. You know you've got 50,000 volts under your chair. Huh? If you nod off and if you fall asleep because it's warm or boring, we'll wake you up very fast. We got one of the true artists of our generation, our own homegrown talent, Janice Wong. Pastry chef of the year by Classic Fine Foods. We got Daniel Sear. You can ask him, why does he call his restaurant the disgruntled chef? Because he's really not a disgruntled person. He's quite a joyful fellow. David Senior, who's the executive chef at Capella, is going to show you a whole bunch of dishes. You got Chef Jimmy. So any of you boys or girls that like tattoos, he has plenty of samples on him. Seems to be fashionable. We got a gentleman from France, Olivier Mendel, who opened a chain of 43 restaurants, got it listed on the stock exchange in France, sold it off and thought he's going to retire. Then he did an introduction of coffee into this part of the world. He thought he'd retire again. He came to make Singapore his home. Today he owns nine restaurants under the Delice Group and hired the first three-star Michelin chef, Bruno Menard, to work and live and cook in Singapore. I understand that Bruno has quite a bit of turnover and stuff. Happens. As I said, you can't stand the heat, don't go to the kitchen. The guy is tough as a nail. He's one of the most brilliant cooks there is. Then, of course, we have a little surprise for you to make the speech from Olivier Wendel a bit more interesting. He has just informed me that Yannick Alenos, three-star Michelin chef, who is presently cooking for the Volkomir Summit, will be speaking together with him. So to all you young, young talent, once they are over speaking, make sure you ask them a lot of questions. He brought his son along, also in the chef's uniform, ask him how he got his three stars, ask him whether he's working nine to five, and how he got there where he is. I see one big smiling face there. And then we have the president of the Singapore Chefs Association, Mr. Edmund To, who is assistant vice president at Resorts Global, our own talent, again, talking about what it's being like a chef in Singapore and how you can make a difference to your career. Now this is the first inaugural, it's called inaugural, the first Youth Chefs Day. We have already confirmed next year we're going to do a bigger one, invite more talent in and give you even more interesting exposure. So to all of you, go into the Facebook of Welcome Me Series, say like, write in, give feedback, give comments, what you like most, what is it you didn't understand, and what you would like to see next year. What is of personal interest for you? Okay? So guys, gals, this is rock and roll now. It's going to be non-stop. Have fun. Enjoy. Did I drop something? Uh, next time you just go stand next to Herb Hunpin and tell me I forgot to mention the main sponsor, which I did in the beginning, but I'll do that again. She's reporting back. Ms. Nancy O from Meat Livestock Australia. Please stand up to be recognized. We'd like to invite uh, Ms. Nancy O actually to come and address all the students as well, Ms. O. So all enjoy, have fun, and learn as much as you can. Thank you. and gentlemen, on behalf of Need and Livestock Australia, we welcome you to the MLA Youth Chef Day. And it is a great pleasure to see such a group respond today. MLA would like to thank Peter Kidd and his team today for giving MLA the opportunity and platform to be the premium lemon beef sponsor for the World Gourmet Summit 2013. 
And now I would like to present Mr. Ernst Huber, owner of Huber uh, Situ sorry, Huber Butchery, to present a session on the art of butchery. Enjoy. Mr. Huber. Thank you.